Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast, my friends. This is Byron. I'm here with... I'm Gary. I'm here as usual. All right, we've got a great episode for you guys. Uh, we got Matt Thornton, an interview with Matt Thornton, so that's going to be awesome. we got a legend on, on today. So. Yeah, we talk about uh, a lot of his stuff, you, you know, a lot of fundamentals in jiu-jitsu, aliveness, and how uh, to use that to train. And then he also has a method called the I method. Um, it's real cool. Like, it's, it's how to introduce somebody to, like, a new technique and get it to where they can actually do it. Like, it's three different things. It's inter- introdu- introduce the move, uh, isolate the move, and then integrate it into your game. So, like... You know, show them the move without any resistance, and then isolate the move, give some resistance, and then a little bit of drilling kind of thing, and then work it in your yep. game. Then introduce it the to your method. Game. Yep. Lots of stuff, guys. It's gonna be, it's a great interview. Real excited about having him on the show. So, Gary, what's up, man? Nothing, nothing at all. What about you? Nothing. Uh, had a good training this morning. That was fun. And got to train roller. with Byron a little bit this morning, but so, he had to leave early. I did. I had to go train somewhere else for a tiny bit, you know, yep. Fox Fitness for a little bit and roll with those guys. He left me. I left you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want to risk getting choked any more than I already did. So some of you guys, uh, a lot of you guys are enjoying the uh, Randy Couture updates at the end of the end of the show. At the, after the music rolls... Uh, my mom comes on, gives a little update about how Randy Couture is while he's dancing. That's my favorite part. Yeah. Uh, who would have thought my mom would be like one of the better members of the BJ Brick team? I'm actually thinking <laughs> that I'm probably going to get kicked off this show, <laughs> and it's then going to be called Byron and his mom. But, She's going to take my spot. Uh, I'm going to not – I'll spoil it. You know, who cares? Um, this will be the last of the uh, segment with uh, Ultimate Dancing with my mom. Because uh, Randy Couture got voted off. Man, when I saw that on my news feed this week, <laughs> I was disappointed. I really was. I I can't say I've watched any of the episodes, so I don't really know. Yeah, and you did not vote, and neither did yep. I. Yeah. But uh, I was. Uh, I would have kept him on. Yeah, I got to thinking about it, and it wouldn't surprise me if she was sugarcoating uh, some of his maybe lackluster dance moves just to be polite and nice. Yeah. That's not. That's something that she might do. You know. And maybe she's just been uh, putting a nice uh, spin on things for us, and uh, he was really not that good. Yeah, could have. I, I mean, I, I thought he was really good from the. <laughs> but can you imagine those judges? They're probably on their. I don't know how many seasons they've had, but they've been on there a lot. Yeah. You imagine it must have been a little terrifying to uh, vote Randy Couture off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think no. I think the audience votes. No, I'm not sure. No. Or, yeah, maybe the audience does, but I think because I have watched it before. Yeah, like they give they them talk scores. Yeah, you're right. I do think the audience gets involved. I think there's a number you call. Yeah. So, but uh, do stay tuned uh, to the end of the podcast. You will catch the last segment of alternate ultimate dancing with my mom. So uh, it should be fun. And then, if you have any ideas of what we can do to replace <laughs> that, just send us an email: bjjbrick at gmail dot com. That's right, Gary. Uh, let's see. Let's get our uh, quote of the week going here. I've got one from Abraham Lincoln. He uh, sent me an email just the other day. He said he wrote this quote. So, well, hey, you know what's even better about this is we've got Abraham Lincoln. We're going to use a quote from him. <laughs> but I don't know if you guys know, but Abraham Lincoln was a wrestler. Yeah. So we got the right president in here. There are several presidents that wrestled. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, build that strong character. Yeah, it re- I mean, it really does. I mean, who do you want leading you? A wrestler or uh, somebody who played bocce ball? <laughs> <laughs> not sure what that is, but I would pick the wrestler. Here, here's and the quote. no, I don't mean any disrespect to the people who play bocce yeah, the, ball. The, the, the dozens of fans out there that have the both bocce ball and jiu-jitsu related. And definitely check out our other podcast, BJJ Bocce Brick. <laughs> All right, Gary, let's keep uh, keep steamrolling here. Um, Abraham Lincoln, he says, I'm a slow walker, but I never walk back. And that just goes to attest to, to continual progress um, 
at sometimes a slow pace, but just continual progress and not, yeah. not going backwards. You know, that also reminds me of the other quote, uh, a black belt is a white belt who never quit. It's, yeah. You just uh, just keep going. It, the If the results are too easy, you know, it's almost like that journey is not yeah. the best. It's not the most fun, or if that's even a word, but you, you're going to have some setbacks and, and all, all sorts of stuff that are going to, you know, impede your path. And you just got to just keep going, just keep going forward. And uh, that's, uh, ah, I love that quote. Yeah, just, you know, he does walk slow. He, you know, he's not going 110 miles an hour. And he's probably walking really slow now. <laughs> hey, it's uh, it's too it's too soon, Gary. Too soon to make, make jokes about Abraham Lincoln. Um, but... Just slow, continual progress. That's how. That's how most people do most things that they end up doing well. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty easy to say. Um, Just keep plugging away. It uh, the results will come. Yep. So that is the quote of the week from Abraham Lincoln. If you don't know who he is, uh, just Google it, and he'll pop right up. There's lots of stuff to read about him. Um, check him out. <laughs> check him out. <laughs> and if you don't know who Abraham Lincoln is. You probably didn't do very good in uh, social studies. At least if you're from the U.S. I don't yeah. know if, yeah. if other other countries. Yeah, he's he's one of the main ones to learn about anyway. Yeah, he's a, so Abraham Lincoln, George Washington. They're probably the Roosevelt, two. Roosevelt, Eisenhower, yeah. Yeah, Obama. Those are, the, those are the big ones. Yeah. So uh, and 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 hey guys, next week Matt Thornton's giving us our quote. Oh, definitely. So Stage. check out us next week. Yep. Yeah. So that'll be uh, it. Won't be Abe Lincoln, but it's Matt Thornton. And it's a good quote, and it and it and it does relate to what he talks about a lot today. But it's it's awesome. So that'll be fun. So Gary, the music is telling us that it is well past time to get to the article of the week. Article of the week time. What do we got this week? Well, to just keep it as vulgar as it comes out of the uh, article factory here from our friends at Jujitsu Times. How to be a douche in jujitsu? Oh, that's douche. I thought it was douche. <laughs> We'll say that. How to be a douche in jujitsu. And it's, of course, like being kind of funny. Like, don't do these things, obviously. Um, nothing here. Uh, it's a fun article. It's funny. We'll put a link to it on the uh, on the website. Uh, I'll get the first one here, Gary. Celebrating after you tap somebody out. I do that a lot. So, like, that's the, that's the like, they tap and you say, yeah! You know, it's like... <laughs> We actually had uh, we talked about that in one of, uh, here a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, um, that's just rude. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, when you get submitted, you get very angry. That's uh, another bad one. It's uh, kind of the opposite of the celebrating. Yeah. Uh, another one down the list, um, and there's also explanations with each with each of these as well. But um, saying like "let's go light" and then you just full throttle, man. I've seen that happen a lot of times. That's a good trick to do to Gary because he will suck her into that every time. Hey, are you want to roll light? Can I warm up? And then like, boom, hit him, hit him like a ton of bricks. And, I've had uh, that happen a lot of times. It's the guy tells me he's going to go light, and next thing you know, he comes at me like a wounded cougar, and uh, <laughs> it's never, never a good feeling to yeah. start. start. G- Gary's laying there like a like a fresh donut on the floor, <laughs> ready to roll light, and uh, this guy's trying to murder him. Uh, the next one. Uh, you know, when you start talking about who tapped who, you know, or uh, Byron tapped me, I tapped Byron, so and so tapped who. It's training. We're yeah. all having fun. It's not. A, it's not as bad if you're talking about um, who like tapped a positive you. Positive thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, dude, he's getting. He's got a good triangle. Yeah. You know, he got. He got yeah. me the other day that it surprised me. But it seems like it's normally the other way. It's yeah. Like, somehow, like you guys could be talking about that fresh donut on the floor, but you switch <laughs> the conversation to, hey, I tapped out Byron. Hey, I tapped out so and so. Like, it has nothing to do with the conversation. You just wanted to get it out there and let everybody know. Uh, the next one down the list is uh, knee on the throat, and we could expand that to like knee anywhere or like just like a pressure point situation almost. But just like just trying to make somebody hurt for no particular reason. Um, you're not going to get them to tap. Yeah, it's just being rude. Uh, the big one, I think uh, this happens a lot, is the washer gi. Washer gi. Definitely washer gi. You know, we don't want diseases. We don't want smells. No more than we already have, Gary. Yep. Well, smells are hard enough to combat, you know, as it is. Washer gi. And uh, 
Uh, maybe, maybe controversial, maybe not. Wash your belt, hang it up to dry, let it dry. I mean, it's like not washing 5% of your ghee yeah. every time over and over and, again. And, you know, it really just says wash your ghee, but like Byron added in belt, um, basically the same thing. Wash your hair, uh, wash your <laughs> wash your shorts, you know, wash your rash guard. Yeah. So it's just cleanliness. Yep. Going down the list here, keep your nails short. Um, nobody likes to get cut in an accident, you know, and it is going to, it's an accident. Yeah. Um, but you know, I keep uh, fingernail clippers in my in my gym bag. Yeah, most people. Because I'll roll up, I'm like, oh, I forgot. You know, yeah. it's been like three days since I've been on the mat. Clip them right there yeah. in the car before I get out. And yeah, nothing wrong with that. Outside the gym, who cares? Yep. Um, next one there is heel hooks of 240 degrees. So that's hot. That is hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, don't put heel hooks on and crank them. Uh, you're just gonna injure somebody. Yeah, and I would say that with any submission, you know, like get, give your opponent, your partner, opponent, whoever you're rolling with, time to tap. You know, yeah. like that's respectful. Yeah, it's all about control. If I've got you know an arm bar and I've got your arm almost straightened out, I can just control it. Yeah, it's there's no need to just hip up into it and make my training partner hurt. Yeah, uh, ringworm is still taboo, and I would say you know even for your fiance, don't give her a ringworm, guys. Give her yeah. a real ring. Yeah, yeah, it wants a real ring. Not, <laughs> no. you know. But the one thing about the ringworm is it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yep, all around. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, quick uh, ringworm tip, get the Lamisil. That's what I recommend. Um, obviously, I'm not trying to dispense medical advice like uh, free samples at the, at the doctor's office. But uh, I, I do Lamisil or the generic brand. It's like, it says do it once a day or whatever. Do it like nine times, I, several times a day. Keep that sucker clean. And it goes away within a week or so. I mean, it's not that bad. But And I haven't had it forever because I think we're getting better at it. When you get it, stay off the mat. Yeah, that's the key. Stay off the mat. So There's the list. There's a, a lot more details to all of it. Um, Jiu-Jitsu Times is the website. It's, uh, the article is titled Don't Be a Douche or Douche in uh, Jiu-Jitsu. So don't be that guy. Yeah. You know, be fun to train with. That's more. You know, people get a lot out of Jiu-Jitsu, but one of the things that people talk about the most is like the friendships they make and, and, and the people that, that they uh, train with. You're going to miss out on that if you're going to be the Douche. Yeah, I mean, the big thing, like Byron said, is the friendships. You just think about how long you've been training, all the people you've known, and uh, you there's that bond you get from, uh, you know, sweating together on the mat there. So, uh, as Byron said, don't be the douche. Never do. <laughs> now you're putting me on that. So, uh, getting ready to roll the interview here. I forgot to mention at the beginning of the show that we do talk about uh, Conor McGregor. Um, we talk about his striking. We talk about his... Um, his fundamentals and then you know towards the end of it we do talk about like he just got his brown belt and he does have a brown belt scheme that's very important to him that he's not just giving the brown belt to guys that do well in the UFC that don't back it up so that's that's cool and that they he's willing to train in the gi and to and to, to work on his ground game like that yeah you know I was just uh, um, I saw on the internet there here not too long ago they were some of the nogi matches that uh, Conor McGregor's had. So yeah, that was kind of fun to watch those. I watched a couple of them there just the other day. Cool. We'll go ahead and roll the interview, and then we'll be back at the end of it. And... All right, my friends, it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Thornton to the BJJ Break Podcast. How are you doing today, Matt? Good. Good. Nice to be here. Good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, it's always uh, interesting keeping up with you online and, and seeing what you're up to, and and uh, you always have some great philosophies about about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA, and it's it's good to have you here. If somebody hasn't Thanks heard, very much. yeah, if somebody hasn't heard of you, could you tell us a little bit about about who you are and, and the Straight Blast Gym, and a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, Makes martial arts coach, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. I started uh, training martial arts in the uh, when I was a kid in the very early eighties. I think I. Uh, I w- when I was out of the military, I took up boxing and went into JKD. This was um, several years before the f- first UFC. Uh, eventually started teaching kickboxing and moved up here in Portland, Oregon, where I was teaching that. And then I uh, ran into a gentleman by the name of Fabio Santos, um, and he had put an article, a classified ad in the newspaper, asking for people to come and try and beat him up as because he was trying to get back <laughs> in shape, and that was his way of doing it. And he was a black belt um 
under Hicks and Gracie, or Holes Gracie originally. So that was my first introduction to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I was super impressed. I took a few lessons from him and then also uh, was fortunate enough to meet Hickson and train with him for a bit. And then the UFC hit and um, went from there. And SPG kind of started about, uh, I would say, a year or so before the first UFC. And my goal was just to be true to fighting, you know, be able to learn what works and what doesn't work in a fight and be able to train in, you know, the way an athlete would train. And, um, and it worked out well. Cool. Yeah. And your gym is, how many, how many gyms are there? That, you know, if people ask me that, I'm never quite sure because we're always adding a, a new small location here or there. We have, we have big commercial gyms like my own. Um, my, uh, one of my black coats has a big one in, my, in uh, Montana. And then, of course, uh, SBG Ireland and uh, SBG UK and places like that. And we also have a lot of smaller clubs that are uh, a part of our organization. We have um, the last couple of years, we have a new one in Seattle. We have one now that we've added in uh, Idaho. So I'm going to have to take a guess because I don't want to leave anybody out. But I, <laughs> we're somewhere between 20 and 30 when you add everybody up. Cool. Wow. That's really neat. And uh, no matter where you are, you should be, you know decent range of finding one that you could check out at least in the u.s or you get several internationally sure. obviously yeah well i want to ask a little bit about you we'll do we'll do a lot of stuff about coaching and and uh and some of your philosophies but could you describe your style of of grappling or jujitsu my style um yeah i mean my my own personal game is that what you mean yeah my own personal game has always been very simple and uh i don't I've never really liked movements that were that complicated. I'm not, I'm, I'm large, you know, I'm, I'm a heavyweight. I've, I've been a heavyweight all my adult life, so I'm not particularly quick. Um, I've never thought of myself as a very good athlete in any way. Um, so for me, um, jujitsu is about, what fascinates me about jujitsu is, is the science that makes it work. So the, what fascinates me about jujitsu is, is how somebody smaller and, or somebody weaker can beat somebody larger. How, how a small woman can theoretically on the mat beat a larger man, well, uh, assuming the jiu-jitsu is at a high enough level. So then the question is, what is it that's at a high enough level? And my answer to that for the last 20 years has always been fundamentals. So when I coach, all I teach is fundamentals. As far as my own game, it's very simple. It's very uh, it, it's geared around the fundamentals. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I'll still have a few sweeps or setups that I personally like and use just because they work for my, my body and my personality, but those aren't usually what I what I teach on the mat. One of the things I always tell my black belts and instructors is that when you're teaching class, if you ever say during class or during seminar, here's something I do a lot, then you should immediately check yourself because you're probably coaching something uh, you shouldn't be coaching. I really want to veer away from teaching my personal style, or having any of my coaches teach their personal style, in the sense that what I can do or not do on the mat doesn't really make any difference, and just focus on fundamentals and then let every individual develop their own style. So all my black, I think I have uh, 10 black belts that I've given out in the last uh, 13 years. Um, they're all totally different, and none of them you know, have my particular game. The, the only... Um, common denominator you find is that of course to be at that level they all have very good fundamentals but they have very different styles very different uh, ways of attack very different positions they like um, a lot of it you know can be traced directly back to their personality which I think plays more of a role than actually people's build does in the, in the long term as far as how, how they play jiu-jitsu yeah. but that's kind of the SPG approach the style is very individual and then the delivery system is what we want to teach and that transcends individual bodies that's very interesting so if let's say i have a uh arm and guillotine i like a lot i'm, I'm better yeah. like backing up a few steps and showing some fundamentals that may be like some good guard work that may be that i'm comfortable teaching but not actually just showing my move is that what you're kind of saying exactly that's so, exactly what i'm saying so um you know, you can think of it like this. Jiu-Jitsu, think of jiu-jitsu, the analogy I use a lot is jiu-jitsu, think of it as a big map of a city. Okay. And in the beginning, when, when you're dealing with white belts, <clears throat> myself included, you know, when I first started jiu-jitsu, you don't know anything about, uh, especially if, if, like, 
if like me, you had no wrestling background, you don't really know anything about the ground. And there's all kinds of different positions you can find yourself on the ground, as we all know, those of us that do jiu-jitsu. And Brazilian jiu-jitsu is designed to cover more or less every conceivable position you can be with someone on the ground in a fight. And those major positions like close guard, open guard, half guard top, half guard bottom, cross sides top, head and arm, you can go through the list of the, you know, the major fundamental positions. You can think of those as major neighborhoods. And there are core movements that everybody needs to know how to do, male, female, older, larger, smaller, weaker, younger. We all need to know how to do them, and we are all going to essentially do them the same way because there is a better way to do so. There is a appropriate best way to do, for example, a rear naked choke, Yeah. scientifically speaking. And those are the major freeways that get you back and forth between those positions. And once you can drive around and go back and forth between the different positions, and you start to enter into the blue belt phase, and then when you get to purple belt, and at least as far as I do it, a lot of my purple belts are purple belts for years. I think I was a purple belt for probably five or six years myself. And that's where you really put in all the detail on the map. Um, and kind of like the Google Earth stage where you fill in all the, <laughs> all the lines. Yeah. And then as you go from brown to black, what happens is as you put your body under competitive pressure from um, opponents, you figure out the best routes for you. Yeah. You're going to have a particular way that you like to go from point A to point B. And the temptation then is when you become a black belt and you open up your own school and you start to teach class, you teach your routes. And that's a huge mistake because most people are not going to be good at your routes. Um, and what you want to do instead is go back, give them the fundamentals of the map, let them explore and find their own routes. And that process is short-circuited when you begin teaching a style. So how, would, how do the students find, if you're teaching the, the fundamentals and you're, you're staying away from your own personal game, they just they they just drill those fundamentals and work them with live opponents and they'll find their own find their own game amongst each other. Or? Absolutely. So okay. I mean, for us in, in SBG, when we use the word drill, we're talking about um, resistance. So yeah, um, not repetition. So we'll have introduction of a, of a basic movement. For example, um, you know, a headlock escape, and uh, they repeat it enough times without resistance so that the coach knows that they're able to do it properly um, without resistance. They can actually perform the movement. And for most people, even people who aren't very athletic, even older people or people that are, you know, might be 45 and coming off of a desk job and haven't done anything, for most people, if the coach is articulate and understands the art enough, knows how to run a class, that process doesn't take more than about 10 minutes. And the repetition beyond that over and over again becomes – more often than not mindless, most people can't focus on anything properly for more than about 120 seconds and <laughs> counterproductive. So yeah. once we know that they can do the movement properly, then it's just like weight training. You slowly add more and more weight. You add more and more appropriate resistance, obviously making sure that nobody gets hurt and it's a fun environment, but you add more resistance because only with resistance do you get timing. And of course, timing is everything in jujitsu. So from that, they get the timing. And then as they start to roll and play and grow on the mat, they'll find out which positions they like and which type of guards they like and which, uh, you know, how they like to play, what their favorite setups are. And, and that's an individual process. Uh, it has to be, you know, if you're going to be a good black coach, you have to roll the way you're supposed to roll, not the way somebody else rolls. And they, they don't need me for that. They figure that out. Everybody figures that out on their own. What they need a coach for is to know how to do the proper fundamentals. And so that's what we focus on in our in our classes. That's cool. I think back to your map analogy, like um, maybe driving like the major roads and highways, uh, you're, you're with the coach like as a tour. And then like if you're going to go explore that neighborhood, you're on your own on your feet, you know, go out there and check it out and, and, and see how right. you could adapt your game to work. Right. And, and the process too, I mean, we're talking about a long-term process with jiu-jitsu, so we're talking about something that for most people takes at least a decade, yeah. assuming, you know, they're coming in a couple de a couple nights a week and not training six days a week because most people have jobs and things. So for most people, it takes a decade or longer, so it's a long-term process. And um, it's, it's a very, it's a process that you don't choose. It's not like, you know, one of the, I, a long time ago, like, you know, been more than 25 years now, I think. But back when I started martial arts um, as a young adult, like I said, I was in the, the JKD community. And 
and one of the fallacies that I think a lot of a lot of those guys hang on to is that martial arts is somehow like a buffet, all you can eat buffet, and you can just go and get like I'll have some you know some Chinese um, barbecue pork, and then I'll have Mongolian beef, and let me just throw in some spaghetti and roast beef, and you know I think that'll be the plate that I want. That'll work for me. A little bit of here, a little bit there, and that's not how fighting works. How fighting works is you get very, very good at the fundamentals of the delivery system, which transcends culture because it's a science, and anything that transcends culture, anything that's true transcends culture. Like if I told you uh, we were going to study Canadian geometry, I would I would hope that you would laugh at me because geometry is not Canadian. It transcends culture, <laughs> just like jiu-jitsu does, right? Yeah, a rear naked yeah. choke, an appropriate way to do a rear naked choke is neither Brazilian nor Japanese. It's a delivery system. Yeah. So once you learn those fundamentals, it is from sparring, it is from rolling, and it is from putting your your body under pressure. It's from resistance that you learn what your best routes are. You don't get to pick and choose. I mean, you can try. People, you know, younger black belts and you know, or purple belts and stuff will go. I want to learn this guard. I want to learn that guard, and that's fine. And they might see a particular competitor and say, "I think that might work really good for my game," and that's fine too. But you never really know until you put your body under pressure. And then under pressure, your body develops its movement. And uh, I don't know what a blue belt's game should be like when they're a black belt. Even after having done this for 23 years, I have no idea. And I think they have even less idea than I do. Yeah. And it, it, it is just through the process of playing on the mat that they start to figure it out. Could you give – we keep talking about fundamentals and non some, – maybe some – uh, examples of some fundamental either positions, I guess you did positions already, but like some techniques and some non-fundamental uh, techniques? Sure. So fundamental is um, something everybody needs to know how to do. This is this is my basic uh, criteria for it. It's something that everybody's going to need to know how to do. So if they walk through the door, the, do I think everybody needs to know how to do uh, a broom below sweep? No. Uh, do I think everybody needs to know how to do a basic headlock escape or shrimp? Yes. So it's something everybody. I think everybody needs to know how to do. It's not optional. Yeah. You can be a very good uh, jiu-jitsu player and not play the Lagiva guard. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want you to be exposed to it. It just means that might not be your guard. But you can't be a very good jiu-jitsu player if you don't understand the principle of three points of contact and open guard. Yeah. Or, you know, how to disrupt somebody's base and posture. So these basic concepts, the science behind why open guard works and what your major objective is, regardless of uh, the particular name that's attached to it, that's the fundamental. So it's something everybody needs to know how to do. It's something that we're all going to essentially do more or less the same way, like a rear naked choke, right? That is an appropriate and proper way to do it. There's a, mechanically a best way to do it based on the fact that we all have two arms and two legs and you know, we're all human beings. It doesn't really matter what part of the world you're born in in that sense. Yeah. And um, that's really the, the definition of a fundamental, and that, that underpins the delivery system. So if you think of it in, to give another example outside of jujitsu, you know, people, people are looking at one of, uh, one of my black belts fighters, um, Conor McGregor, right now. Yeah. And watching his stand-up, and people will attribute his stand-up to karate or this or that. And um, the average striking coach, I don't think, has a clue as to exactly what it is he's doing. Great striking coaches see it immediately. But his stance isn't karate. It's not uh, a particular thing. It's based in the fundamentals of movement in the sense that he's brilliant at going in and out. He's a smart striker, so he's not going to trade. He's not going to get wound up. He's going to pick his shots and knock the guy out, and he's probably not going to get hit. And going forward and backwards, the best way to do that is more sideways, which is what a fencer's stand the way they do. If they stand, if fencers stood like Muay Thai fighters, they'd all get stabbed in the heart. Of it, right? But <laughs> yeah. it's not because of a, it's not because of a culture. It's because as a human being, that's the way the body works best. And so what I'm saying is, when you uh, it's like making alcohol. You got to distill the movement down as simple as possible, but no simpler. You keep boiling it down the way a scientist would, and using the principle of parsimony. And when you get down to the essence of the movement. What uh, what is always there if it's done correctly? What is not style specific? That's the fundamental. And as a coach, that's the only thing I'm interested in teaching. And it doesn't mean that it's bad to teach the other stuff, or you know, people can't teach their style. I don't, that's fine. People can do whatever they want to do. I'm saying myself personally, that's the only thing I'm interested in teaching, and it's usually the only thing that catches my attention. And the rest of it, I 
it's is nice and it's cool to watch, but um, personally doesn't interest me. I, you know, having myself worked a lot on fundamentals and then also worked on different types of games that weren't my style or, or, or fit for me. You never work. You never waste your time if you're working on your fundamentals. But no. I've I've wasted a decent amount of time working on guards I don't like anymore and 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 sweeps that never worked for me that well and and so like it's always a good amount of time well spent working on your fundamentals. It's what I think people don't understand, and part of it I think is just a language issue. Part of it's people haven't been exposed to this type of coaching usually, but part of it too is a language issue in, in the word fundamental. People think that when we're talking about fundamental, we're talking about some rigid set of movements that we don't let the students go beyond and that they're not allowed to explore. Like if you came into my gym, then nobody would be doing you know the newest guard that they're doing at IBJJF or whatever. But the reality is actually the opposite. So if, if you take, for example, uh, to use a different analogy, if you're, if you're going to teach somebody to paint, you have a bunch of kids and you're going to teach them how to paint. You yeah. teach them the basic principles of oil painting and color and composition and shadow and all those kind of things and then allow them to make their own paintings. That's group one. And in group two, in a separate room, you teach them paint by numbers. So they all get a palette and they all get, uh, that's already made for them, and they all get uh, a canvas and it's all drawn out with numbers and all they have to do is fill in the, the numbers in the canvas. I think it goes without saying which of those two groups is going to be more creative, which of those two yeah. groups is going to be more individualistic. But what's important to remember is it's the first group, the group that is not painting by numbers, that's sticking and learning to the fundamentals. So when you come into any, pretty much any SPGM, and whether you go to Ireland or the UK or here or any of any of our uh, gyms, academies, by the time somebody gets a purple belt, all the different purple belts, even blue belts on the mat and above, they're all totally different. So my athletes are getting exposed to guys in, you know, male and female athletes who like to roll upside down and do scorpion guard or whatever, and they're getting exposed to people who play very uh, close guard. They're getting exposed to all kinds of different games because I don't teach style uh, move by move. I just teach fundamentals and then let them play. And they get, you get better <laughs> if, you know, if, if what you're interested in is the fancier stuff of jiu-jitsu, like the, the prettier things uh, that people can do you get better at that faster when you ignore it and focus on the fundamentals which is ironic and, and something that i think a lot of people don't realize because they go about it the wrong way but it is absolutely provable and and uh and true yeah I, i'm with you on that that's that's a good way to put it and i like your analogy with the paint and the kids and the creativity differences um I want to talk to you a little bit about aliveness. If somebody's never heard that that word before, can you describe what that means? Sure. Aliveness is a one word to essentially, and it essentially means timing, energy, and motion. And by energy, I mean <clears throat> resistance, not some you know hippie thing, but uh, resistance, actual physical resistance. So, if you, for anything to be alive, it has to incorporate those three aspects. If you remove one of those aspects, it's no longer alive. It's a pattern. And once you in, train in the form of a pattern, there's no longer climbing. And this is the thing that uh, so many people don't understand, I think, about martial arts. Um, it's the thing that's absent in traditional martial arts. It's the reason why Japanese jiu-jitsu and Aikido and those kind of things don't work and um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu will. And even if we took, and, and people often think it's the movements, but even if we took the movements of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and taught them in a traditional manner, the way it would be more inclined to teach, for example, Aikido, where everything is in a pattern. Yeah. Everything is choreographed. It wouldn't matter that those movements are effective. You still wouldn't be able to fight. Um, so the essential point behind everything, the thing that makes everything work, is aliveness, which is timing, energy, motion. They're kind of three words for the same thing when they're done properly. But uh, it is an unpatterned, resisting opponent. It is competition. Um not public competition in front of a group, but competition against another human being who's not always cooperating with you, where timing comes from. And absent that, there's just no timing. I mean, I think there is still a lot of people have this idea if they just perform a movement enough, then their timing will be such that when they go into a match, they're going to be able to pull it off at just the right time, and that's not how life works. That's not how sports works. So to, to perform the movement 
against a resisting opponent, you have to practice the movement against resisting opponents. You have to practice the movement outside of a pattern, or there's no timing. And that's that's the principle of aliveness. Do you prefer for like for your class to do some aliveness training them to just roll, or or do you like to put them in a certain position, have them work uh, from there, or I guess a little bit of both? Uh, well, we use what we call an eye method, and it begins um, where we use more of one portion, and as they progress through the art and get better and more physically capable of, uh, of performing the art, the, the uh, percentages change a little bit, but the process doesn't. So the process is as follows. It's a three-step process. Introduction, integration, or I'm sorry, introduction, isolation, integration. So in the beginning... Let's just say somebody knows nothing about jiu-jitsu. Then we focus a lot on introduction of the movement. And in the introduction phase of the movement, there is no resistance. So they're just practicing the movement, you know, with another human. Yeah. But the person's not, not really trying to smash them or, or put them back down. They're letting them work the escape so that they can learn how to do it mechanically. But once they've learned how to do it mechanically, which, like I said, for the average person, um, if they're taught, Appropriately, if the curriculum is, is, is at a level that's appropriate for the student, it doesn't usually take more than about 10 minutes. Then you need to get into the isolation stage. And the isolation stage is where we isolate that piece that you just learned and we add resistance. And this is where people have to learn how to do drills. How to, the coaches have to learn how to drill um, appropriately. So it doesn't mean they're sparring. Because a lot of people equate alive and so like, well, we just, it's just sparring. It's not sparring. It, it, it is drilling specific things with resistance, and that's the isolation stage. And then, and that's the next piece, and that's where you get the timing. So the first part, you learn how to do the movement correctly. The second part, you start to acquire timing, and you, you, you maintain that you know process of acquiring timing for the rest of your life. But you get the timing from the resistance, the isolation stage. And then integration stage is last, and that's where we try and put it back in the context of what we're doing, whether it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or mixed martial arts or self-defense or whatever the the class was, and that could be rolling. So, you know, uh, to give an example, you come in, you spend 10 or 15 minutes learning a headlock escape or two headlock escapes that you can take chain together. We make sure that everybody in the class knows how to do it uh, without resistance with each other appropriately and mechanically correctly. Then we start to drill it. One side might hold the other one down. There's different ways to drill, but they start to drill it where they're working with resistance. Two-minute rounds, five-minute rounds, the length of the round will depend on you know, how in shape they are, how advanced the group is in terms of athletically. And that'll be maybe the major portion of the class. And then towards the end of the class, we might have them start in the headlock and then you wrestle to submission. And that's the way we do it. And, and that's how we teach everything. The only thing that changes is the amount of time you might do one of those three phases as opposed to the other. But we always do that. And what a lot of schools do the traditional martial arts is essentially just all introduction stage because whether you put it in a two-person pattern or whether you do it in a kata or whether you just land the mat and yeah. perform it by yourself, it doesn't matter. There's no resistance. So they're always doing introduction phase. And what a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools do is they'll do a lot of introduction phase, and if you're lucky, the movement, the techniques are showing you are related somehow, but they'll just show you some techniques. Yeah. And then everybody rolls, and you roll. So you're going right from the introduction stage in the integration stage, skipping the isolation stage. And what happens in that kind of environment, so I, I just teach you, I've just taught you a new technique perhaps that you didn't know before. You practice it, with, you know, with a bunch of repetitions without any resistance. And then I, okay, guys, let's roll, and everybody touches hands and wrestles. And especially if you're in an environment that's competitive, you're not going to go and try and work the move that I just taught you today because yeah, you just yeah. learned it today. So you're going to go back to your A game, right? And so is the other guy. And you guys get near patterns as we all do with each other where you're battling it out with your sparring partners and you just month goes by and you've forgotten the move you know, there's never a chance to work that move into what you're doing because it was never drilled because repetition isn't a drill and so you never get any timing but the way we do it every time you learn a movement you get timing with that movement and then you roll and uh, that makes a huge difference in, in the uh, speed in which people can get better um, and um, in the way that we can uh, introduce more things to people and have it uh, have them remember the context of what it is we're trying to teach uh, appropriately. 
so to make this more specific about the technique, like let's say we're, we're going to do a triangle. So we start off, you're going to show me the triangle. shouldn't take much more than 10 minutes, you know, maybe a little bit more if I'm slow. Um, so I got the idea of the triangle down. Now maybe we'll start with uh, like a guy already in my triangle, and he's going to try to get out, and I'm going to try to keep him in and, and, and finish it. And then uh, eventually when I graduate to the next level, I'll be able to get to that position while we're just rolling. Is that Am I picking up? What you're saying, kind that's of? exactly right, and uh, that, that's that's a good, uh, very good analogy. And the thing is, uh, you can drill in different ways. So the, you used a good example because with a triangle, when you're dealing with submissions, if the drill part I started from the beginning, like you you started from say close guard, and then had to get the triangle, and it was the first day you learned it, you probably have zero success. Yeah, which doesn't help anybody. You know, it just takes away people's confidence. But with submissions, it's exactly what you just said. We usually work our way backwards. So you might start. We'll give you multiple starting positions, and in the first starting position, it's almost on, and your success rate's probably going to be like 90% finishing that triangle. And then we take a step back. So now maybe you haven't um, you haven't locked your leg in or your foot's on the hip, and then you go, and now your success rate drops a little more, but you're still getting a lot of triangles. And then we work. So you start from um, almost successful, and then work your way backwards. And we might do that for 15 to 20 minutes, but by the time that class ends. What happens is you'll see these people roll with each other. Just regular jiu-jitsu match, start standing around the knees or whatever, and you'll see students in that class that have never done a triangle before in their life that just learned it that day pull off a triangle in a live match. Yeah. And that happened because because they, were, they had a chance to do timing. Whereas if I just taught you the triangle and you did it for 10 minutes without resistance and then we just rolled, you're never going to get the triangle that way. I mean, you will, but you're going to get it in the way that everybody in those kind of environments gets it, and that's just through through lots and lots of roll time. That makes a lot of sense, and I hope I, I think it will for everybody out there. Uh, it sounds like a great way to train, and, and it's it's not just hours and hours and hours on the mat trying to figure out what's going on. It's very right. very smart and scientific. And you talk about like developing right. BJJ scientists as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that's one of my goals with my uh, with my coaches, and part of that's just my own, you know. Um, selfish interest of I, I like I'm always fascinated by a new point on a fundamental so you know I started jiu- I've been doing jiu-jitsu now I think for 23 24 years I think I've been a black belt for 13 years so I've been around jiu-jitsu for a while um, and, uh, and there's new things that come up all the time like Warren Guard or whatever there's always new things being developed <laughs> yeah that's, that's cool it's just personally not usually interesting to me but when I see a detail on a move that I've been doing for 24 years and that everybody does all the time, you know, fundamental, that I didn't know before or I didn't notice before. I didn't I didn't pay attention to tell my students about it before. To me, that's like gold. So it's like uh, it's like painting for gold in a river, you know, and going through all these rocks and all of a sudden you come across that. And there's not many coaches that do that. Hickson is a great example of somebody that does that all the time. Um, when he, you know, you know, all the black belts will show up and he'll teach an upa escape or a, yeah. know, a, a shrimp or an armor and all the stuff that we've all, you, you learn your first week in jujitsu and there's some jam of a principle there about where you put your body or where you put your weight or where the pressure is appropriate or not appropriate that makes all the difference in the world. And so that's the stuff I'm fascinated by. So I'm, uh, I'm always trying to produce coaches that can do that so that I can learn from that as well. And I, I think I'm fairly successful in a lot of my black belts, you know, when I see them and when I watch them teach, they'll teach the, the same positions I taught them, but they've, they've, they've made it even simpler. You know, and they boiled it down to um, even more than I did. And that's, um, that's what I love to see. That, makes, that always makes me proud. And, and uh, I think that's how we advance our organization's curriculum, which ultimately helps affect our athletes in competition. I'm, you know, as we're talking about this and how how you like to keep it everything simple and and fundamental. I remember, you know, I've been to countless seminars and, and a lot of them were great. But sometimes you, you, the guy will show a technique, and they'll show it, you know, three or four times, and you go back with your partner and you're like, "How the hell did I start this technique? I don't. I mean, it was like nine steps to, to do this thing, and and I and I can't remember what he just showed me. You know, hopefully the other guy will. But like boiling things down to get simpler and simpler, and then build on, on that is. That just sounds awesome. Yeah, and um, there's nothing to be afraid of using that method. It's not like you're going to miss out on any of the uh, 
any of the fancier stuff or, yeah. or people are going to be in any way restricted. I mean, everybody's creativity uh, on the mat is increased in that environment. People have more room to play, more room to experiment, more room to come up with things. Um, they're encouraged to make the technique work for their own body. And, and when you understand, you know, if you, if you teach a student, let's say someone is new to a particular movement in jiu-jitsu that they don't have the experience you have and it's a brand new thing for them, if you teach them just the most important, like the, the, the absolute essential things they need to know, and for most positions that's not, that's not much. You're usually talking about one or two principles in terms of posture and three to five pressures of most uh, ways you can go from that posture. And that's the, that's the case with everything in jiu-jitsu. So once you give them that, now they have a framework that when they experiment and practice and do things, they're not going to mess up because they know, oh, I can't do that because that, that'll really put me in jeopardy. But that leaves everything else open. And so it actually provides a lot more freedom for the student to, uh, to not be afraid to experiment and, and make things work because they're starting to understand how the art, how the delivery system works in the sense of physics and leverage. And they're not afraid, so you know, afraid of making a mistake. Afraid that they need to have some yeah. authority figure there tell them exactly how it's supposed to be done. Otherwise, they'll screw it up. We've talked quite a bit about fundamentals uh, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, now, MMA is a, they're different. They have a lot of overlap, but they're different. So, if I'm learning uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, are the fundamentals? Um, is that going to always carry over to MMA, or are they too? Uh, you know what I mean. I don't really want to be pulling oh, guard all the time, that would, but that, that would work that fine. Would be, and, uh, that's the third quality. So, remember, I said that I, I, you asked me about what is a fundamental. Yeah. The two. There's a. There's a third. So the first one is something I think everybody needs to know how to do. Yeah. The second one is it's something that everybody's going to do essentially the same way. Yeah. And the third one is it's something that transcends environment. Okay. So if you take your gi on or you put your gi off or somebody punches you in the face or it's in the parking lot or it's, it's on a mat, it doesn't change. I mean, there's going to be details and um, strategic things that need to be taken into account for sure. But the core fundamental uh, will not change because you all of a sudden find yourself in a different environment. Cool. And that's one of the beautiful things about it as well. So I always tell my because people always ask gi or no gi, and, you know, I, was, I don't care. Like, if, if you put your gi on and your game falls apart, you don't have a game that stays in five pounds. <laughs> yeah. If you take your gi off and your game falls apart, you don't have a game that's based on fundamentals. Um, if you add strikes and your game completely falls apart, you don't have a game that's based on fundamentals. Um, assuming that it's not just a mental issue. I mean, some people... Yeah. wisely, you know, from based in intelligence, don't like getting punched in the face. They have to be taught how to defend that, that space. Yeah. So that they, and they have to be introduced to it, like with all striking, um, gently so that you don't make them gun shy like you would a dog that you hit. But if that, if you're, if they're done, if it's taught properly, like the way they play their game and the fundamental movements that they're going to use in the cage don't change. It's the same jujitsu. And that's the, that's the beautiful, um, beautiful part about it you know all my black belts can put the gi on they can take the gi off you can add slaps you can put gloves on but on the ground you know the core fundamentals of what they're doing identical cool that's, i was wondering about that that's good um now what is your kids program called uh kids program is called growing gorillas and it was developed by my first black belt uh from my home gym in portland oregon he started it uh because he, he, I didn't have a kids program until a few years ago. So I've always, up until that point, I've always just focused on teaching adults. And he was uh, my student, but you know we didn't have a kids program, so he was sending his kids to a different school across yeah. the river. So that what, they could what, do is, uh, what is his name? His name's Travis Davidson. Okay. Yeah, he runs a he runs a gym in Mon Academy in Montana. Now. So he, when he moved to Montana, there was no you know there was no place for his kids to go, and he's he's opening up his own SPG and teaching Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu himself. He's like, I'll, de I'll develop a, a kids program, which he did. And, um, it's excellent. Uh, it's, it's the same as we do, uh, adults in the sense that it's focused on fundamentals and, uh, it's just age appropriate for the children and, and activity appropriate. And the programs are divided up by, uh, by age, how old, the, how old the children are. But, um, yeah, he's the one that came up with that. that I started, that program at my gym a few years ago and now we have a big kids program and it's great so 
Oh, cool. And the same basic, I mean, the same training philosophies and stuff are for the kids. Is what exactly. The it's, just, it's just age appropriate. So when you do, we have a base by age. So like the youngest kids are called micro monkeys. <laughs> micro monkey program, of course, isn't going to be as as specific or detail oriented in terms of technique. Though a lot of what they do is, is game and, and play based. Um, and that remains true through the whole kids program. You'll see that in lots of different, uh, pretty, it's pretty universal to, uh, to people who teach children that, uh, intelligently. They always use games and things like that. I like the Gracie bully proof program as well. Same, same idea. Yeah. But as they, as they grow in age and they go through the IBJJF, you know, belt system through the yellow and orange and they get to the, uh, uh age and belt level where they can begin to compete, which for jujitsu is yellow belt with children. Then, then obviously becomes more specific, and we start working more on uh, on specific positions and things like that. But again, the the, co- the whole curriculum is still SPG based in the sense that it's strictly fundamentals, and we just let the children uh, go at it as far as how they want to develop their own style, and it works great. Now you started martial arts as a kid, and and then of course these guys are in the in your kids program. What? What benefits or differences are there for, you know, some kids are just going to do sports no matter what. So versus like a kid going out and doing football or basketball or coming in here and, and training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, is there anything that Jiu-Jitsu does differently for the kids off the mat maybe? Huge difference. Huge difference. That's actually a good question. Um, there's obvious differences. Uh, in the first one being it's not seasonal. Yeah. So the, the child will be there, you know, year, throughout the year, which I think is a positive thing in terms of consistency for kids. The second thing is that it's it's an individual sport, and that makes a huge difference. From you know, th- there's things to be learned uh, from both team sports and individual sports, but there are also lessons that can only be learned in one and not the other. And so there's a lot of lessons that children learn from an individual sport. And the way we do it here, it's very much like a team. I mean, if they do go to compete, they're going to go with their teammates and yeah. they're at the tournament together, and they and they train together and they play together. And so they're a group. But then again, also they have to step onto the mat and um, perform singularly by themselves, which makes a big difference. And then beyond all that, jiu-jitsu is just different from anything else. It really is different in the sense that not only is it an individual sport, I mean, because tennis is an individual sport, right? There's lots of individual sports, but it's an individual sport that's a combat sport. So it yeah. also takes into account all of the emotions and all of the instincts and all of the things that develop from you know, millions of years of evolution that we have inside of us that come out on the mat and can can present themselves on the mat when you're dealing with physical combat, physical contact, and uh, struggle with another human being. And jujitsu of all the comp, so I mean that sets combat sports into a completely different category from other things. And jujitsu of all the combat sports is the only one I would really want my kids to do. Yeah, and uh, maybe wrestling and judo, but I mean, I would never want my kids to box. And I say that as yeah. someone who loves boxing, but I mean, the, the evidence is to brain damage is overwhelming. And jujitsu is a, it really is when it's done appropriately, the gentle art. It's something that they can do as kids. It won't injure them. It won't break them. Um, and when they're eighty, they should be able to still be doing it. And they're not going to be crippled or have, you know, their shoulders out of socket or have brain damage or anything like that. If anything, it should make you sharper and, and brighter as opposed to dropping IQ points. So for all those <laughs> reasons and more, I think it, it truly is an absolutely unique uh, sport for children. Yeah, I, you know, I, I started as an adult myself, but you know, you say it's a, you know, it's, it's both individual sport and a team sport. I remember uh, being at a tournament and one of my teammates out there, and he got triangled the same way I triangled him all the time. I'm like, man, I suck. I didn't. I should have had prepared him. I shouldn't have just triangled him every day. And I should have, you know, been a teammate and told him what I'm doing to him and how he's not how he's falling for it every time. So I mean that. I do think that the kids do build a good sense of a team and and they and they and they make good friends on the mat as well. For sure. Could you th- uh, think back to when you got your black belt, or maybe a little before wow. the end of something that you've learned since then that you didn't really understand? As a lower wow. belt, that's, that's uh, there's too many things there. <laughs> I don't think uh, it kind of sounds um, cliche, yeah, obviously, but it, it is true. I don't really think I started to even begin to understand jujitsu appropriately 
until well after being a black belt. Um, and that's not to say I wasn't able to perform at that level when I was at that level. I mean, I, it is, it's just a understanding of, of what you're doing and, and how the art works evolves over time. And, and black belt really in jujitsu was aside from just a specific, uh, you know, a very tangible level of performance in that you should be able to roll with other black belts and give them game technically. But beyond that, it really is just the beginning of, of your ability to play the game well. It would be like, uh, you know, it takes, let's imagine that for sake of argument, it took the average person 10 years to figure out how to play chess really well. Yeah. And then once they got to the point where they learned how to play chess really well, then they could really sit down and get into those games that, that uh, offer insight into um, the, the deeper levels of chess. And and it, it is really true that it's, it, you don't really get there until, you know, about 10 to 12 years. And then you can play the game well, good, good enough. And at that point, then it, it starts to reveal itself more to you over time. And I think up until that point, um, it's harder because, you, it, at least for me anyway, I didn't have a, that solid of an understanding of it. I think my students have a much better understanding of it than I did. I think my black belts have a much better understanding of it a lot quicker than I did. I like to think that I played some part in that, but it's also just each generation gets a little bit better and a little bit quicker at uh, at figuring out how it works. So for me, it took a while. Yeah, and it it was a different time back then as far as the way totally different teaching time, and no YouTube, none of that stuff. How do you feel about YouTube helping people get with their game? No, uh, I don't think it helps anybody. I think it's valuable to the degree that people use it to inspire themselves to watch matches that they like, or if they're smart enough to focus and under, to be able to identify a fundamental, first of all, and to be able to focus on that in their training, then it could be useful because they can pull up a video of Hickson or, or someone like that uh, who has that kind of a solid game and pull from it. But it can also be counterproductive, and you'll have white belts who can't properly perform an elbow escape yet. Yeah. We're on YouTube trying to figure out the latest sweep taught by, <laughs> you know, the latest high-level black belt competitor that's been doing it since he was five years old. And and um, I personally think that that actually slows rather than yeah. um, increases their their game. And my experience in my own academy has been that that's the case, but it also could just be um, selection bias and that the people that come into my gym and like to really who aren't that good at jujitsu yet but are really focused on YouTube just happen not to be usually the best athletes. That could also be the case. So I don't I don't know for sure, but I'm not a huge fan. I usually just as a joke always tell all my students that and, until they get at least brown belt they should stay on YouTube. Yeah. I think that's interesting the way you say that you might have a selection bias towards those type of students that don't gravitate towards that but Well it just might I, be that it you know it's like uh to give to give you another example, if we did a study and it was a bunch of kids, and we found that kids that played violent video games tended, in whatever you know empirical measurement we came up with, to behave more violently. Yeah, it would be easy. It would be easy to draw the assumption that violent video games lead to increased violence in children. But unless we account for, unless we select for the type of children that child that's playing those games, it could just be the case that violent children like violent video games. Yeah. So when I talk about people coming into my gym and they say, well, they love to go on YouTube all the time and they also tend to be my worst white and blue belts, it could just be the case that people who love to go on YouTube also aren't, you know, the kind of people that excel at jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? I don't know that they're, I don't, it, it's, I have a strong belief that it's, uh, if there's a correlation, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't have any evidence that well, it's causal. If you think about but, it, uh, it's just my bias. They're not. I mean, how how many times are you going to watch like a like a shrimp escape? Right. Do, you know, on YouTube and and be entertained every time. Like you're going to have to go into the to the stuff that's that's way different than the fundamentals in order to be continually entertained by it. I guess. So right. I mean, and and this is also anecdotal, but the the few people that I've seen in my life that. Uh, became very, very good at jujitsu in a very, very short time frame. I've known, you know, half a dozen or so. None of them ever did that. Yeah. These, these weren't the instructional video type people. 
I, I shouldn't even say that because I found instructional videos. They weren't the YouTube type people. Instructional yeah. videos are awesome. Well, instructional videos have a different approach because you could show what you want to show in a organized format. It's like a, it's more like a book. I mean, you're able to get into that person's head more than just watching a random YouTube clip that's six minutes long, that exactly. that it's isn't for you at all. So right. I, I guess what you're saying on that, and I do think YouTube slows people down, and it's it's so frustrating for me to come into class and and have have guys work on a, a new YouTube clip like every day. It's like you're not getting right. anywhere with that. Exactly. Exactly. If you have a student who's going to do his first uh, BJJ tournament, uh, what advice uh, would you give them like a month in advance going up to it? Month in advance? Yeah. Um, you know, I have a pretty strict policy at my gym, my academy, and I try to um, policy might be too strong a word. An environment that I've tried to create over the years where there's never any pressure on anybody to compete. Uh, Okay. I, I I hesitate only a little bit as it relates to jiu-jitsu because when it comes to a jiu-jitsu tournament, I really do tell all the students, and I think my black belts that teach here do the same thing. It's like, you know, I really do think it would be good for everybody to at least try it once. Get out on, on the mat and see if you like it or don't like it uh, because you can become very good at jiu-jitsu and never compete publicly. I mean, let's, when I say, I mean, when we use the word competition, we're talking about going up against people from other schools yeah. in front of a public audience. Whereas people, you know, to get good at jiu-jitsu, you're always competing. Every day you step into the mat, you're competing. You're competing with the people in your gym. Yeah. You're competing with people that come visit your gym. And I have really good black belts who never competed. And I have a lot of really good uh, black belts who compete a lot. And I have, uh, you know, black belts who just most of them have, you know, dabbled here or there. In it. And, and so what I want to do is create an environment where they're encouraged to do it, but I'm never pushing it. Now, with MMA, it's totally different. With MMA, I have a very strict rule. Nobody is ever to ask anybody to take a fight. Nobody is ever to go up to anybody and say, hey, I think you should take a fight or I think you would do good. And my reason behind that is I want to have an environment where somebody comes in and they're very athletic. They're allowed to express that without feeling pressure. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure when you have, especially when you have a larger uh, academy like I do. There's yeah. going to be a tremendous amount of cultural pressure that that people put on themselves, and it takes away the enjoyment of the activity itself. And in the in the long run, really, I'm, what I'm most interested in is that they they never quit. That in 15 or 20 years from now, they're still doing the art. Whether in that pro, in that uh, time frame they compete or don't compete, to be honest with you, doesn't really matter that much to me. So what I, what I want to do is I want to make sure that they love it, that it that it helps make them their life more enjoyable. Hopefully, maybe even become a better person, learn more about themselves, and they stick with it. So that's the uh, that's the kind of environment I've always wanted. So for for competition, we're very low key, uh, and people can go in there and not. So long story short, I probably wouldn't say anything to a student a month a month out because I wouldn't know. Yeah. And, um, they would have to come to me and tell me they were going to do it. And if they came to me and told me they were going to do it and they were just asking for advice, yeah, um, I just tell them, make sure you're you're in good shape because the first time anybody ever competes in a jiu-jitsu tournament, the adrenaline, especially if, you know, assuming this is somebody that, that you know is not ha- doesn't have a long wrestling background and a yeah. lot of experience in in that, can be kind of overwhelming. And usually after the first match, as we all know, you can't even close your hand anymore because your grip goes. So just kind of preparing them for that um, by trying to get them in shape and and then just letting them know that, well, um, one of my, you know, John Kavanaugh says this a lot to his fighters, and I think it's brilliant. And um, and it's brilliant because it's true, which is by the time you step on the mat or by the time you go into the cage, by the time the competition comes, everything's already been done. Yeah. The work's all done. You're not going to all of a sudden magically get better at whatever movement. So... The more the student can just relax, the athlete can just relax and recognize work's been done, let's see what happens. Almost as if you're the passenger in the experience as opposed to the person that's manipulating the scene. The more they can do that, the calmer they can be, the better their fighting in jiu-jitsu is going to be. Because you know, for, for us, my definition of a good athlete is somebody that can, can be calm. I'm not looking for people to be aggressive or angry or or, uh, uh, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So for us, in SPG, it's the opposite. And I'm looking for people that are calm, intelligent, and the more calm and the more intelligent you can be under extreme circumstances, the better you're going to be as a fighter. And uh, 
And so we're just trying to always just kind of, I guess, get them to relax. The work's been done. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And you did mention, you hinted at the wrestlers having experience. And I, I think that's something that is often overlooked that, you know, you, you look at a wrestler doing jujitsu or MMA and you think, oh, he's got he's a great wrestler, he's doing this. But he's also competed about a million times more than you compete when you're doing jujitsu because if I'm going to do jujitsu, i got to travel like four or 500 miles minimum and I get, you know, a small handful of matches. But wrestlers, they get matches every weekend and they get a, a handful every time. They get that that calmness i don't know calm is the right word but they they're used to competing they're used to being in there in in that uncomfortable environment you know wrestling with somebody all the time and in jiu-jitsu and mma it's so much rare so if you walk on the in the cage with you know 200 plus wrestling matches and this is your third mma fight there's there's something to be said for those matches that that are under your belt you may be new to mma or jiu-jitsu but you're more comfortable dealing with a live opponent like that i think exactly i mean um you know, there's a huge difference between somebody who um, walks into a jiu-jitsu tournament for the first time. Let's say it's, it doesn't even have to be like the Pan Ams or yeah. which is just a massive environment, but just your local high school gymnasium. You know, there's all your teammates up there, families, girlfriends, all the different schools, lots of noise. you got to get weighed in. you got to go into a pen, and you got to wait around. You never know when your ring's going to be called, where you're supposed to go. All this different uh, stress can be really... For somebody, anybody who's done it for less than, you know, 10 times, it can be uh, a lot on their nervous system and affect their performance. As opposed to, you take somebody like uh, uh, Dan Henderson, as an example. Yeah. You know, he started wrestling when he was a little kid in grade school and never stopped all the way through university and then went on to the Olympic team and then went on to fight. So he's basically never stopped. He could walk onto a jiu-jitsu tournament. I don't know if he's ever competed in, in a jiu-jitsu tournament. I don't, I don't think he has. But if he did, he'd walk on there. He's not going to be nervous. Yeah. I mean, he competed in Cuba. He's competed, he's competed all over the world. How many times? Thousands of times he's walked onto a mat barefoot or with wrestling shoes, you know, ready to take on an opponent and grapple. And the exposure to that environment is uh, massive. It makes a huge difference. Yep. I couldn't agree with you more. Um Let's think back uh, in time a little bit to you as a blue belt. What were you like compared to what you are now for like your game? Did you keep a lot of those things, or did they uh, change? I was strictly a guard guy. So, in every competition, in all the matches that I won in competition, I never won from top. In fact, I'd have to think about this for a second, but just off the top, I don't think I was ever been on top. Yeah. So I, I pull guard, and then I would finish from guard bottom. So from white belt pretty much through purple to brown, I was more or less just a, an open guard player. And um, and then something happened. I don't know why or what, because, again, it's, it, I don't think any of this is by choice. It's just kind of how your body and things develop. But my sweep started to get a little better. I got a little bit older. Um, people got better at guard passing. People got better at defending uh, submissions and triangles and things. And then it just becomes where I use my guard to get on top and then, you know, usually work from top. So now I play more from top position. So that was a uh, kind of a, a change in my game. But I, yeah. I used to, when I was a blue belt, I would just pull guard immediately and, uh, and attack and then see what happens, which is totally different from... Um, the kind of uh, strategy and style that I usually do now, other than the fact that I start in guard, I usually play kind of small and relaxed. But I'm also I'm also way older, so I don't even know if I could do my purple belt game if I wanted to. Yeah, it's important that I mean it sounds like you, you've kept some things about about your game, but it's changed quite a bit yeah. for different reasons that you know. And that's understandable. What would be a good goal for a student in their first year of jujitsu? The best goal for anybody in the first year of jiu-jitsu is to learn how to relax and roll the right way. Because as soon as somebody learns how to relax and, and roll well, as my as my coach Chris Hunter would say, uh, the faster they're going to get at jiu-jitsu, uh, they're going to get good at jiu-jitsu. And that comes, for some people, that comes within the first year. For well, man, for a lot of people, it really doesn't happen until they're deep into their, into their blue belt. So <laughs> learning to do that is, I think, critical. Uh, and... Uh, as far as how to learn to do that, I think people have to, as a white belt, they have to believe or come to believe, uh, understand 
that the more relaxed they are, ultimately, once they're once they start to pick up more technique, the better they will uh, they will be. And I can understand what happens. You know, one white belt is not very good at jujitsu. Wrestling another white belt is not very good at jujitsu. And the only thing that prevents one from tapping to the other or one from smashing the other is a little extra force or strength or hanging on to that grip, you know, a little bit longer. Um, and that's that's the only thing that allows them to win. And then yeah. over time, you start to create a habit where they get really stiff and tense. But if they can learn to care more about getting good at jiu-jitsu than they do winning, and they can relax within the first year of jiu-jitsu, I really do think that given enough roll time, anybody can become a good black belt in five or six years. Cool. I think what holds people back from that is, is primarily um, not being able to relax. Yeah, and being yeah, that's that's awesome. I like like the that's a good uh, good goal for a first year student or anybody who hasn't got there yet to where they could actually calm down and and I and I and I seem to gravitate more to train with the lower belts that are able to relax, like they're funner to 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 work with than getting knee in the head all the time and you know catching yeah, an elbow to the face. Yeah, everybody wants to roll with those guys. You know, all the all <laughs> the upper belts are going to want to roll with those white belts too, not because they're they're beating them, but because it's just it's not a it's not a it's not a brutal role. You can yeah. better afterwards and you can, you can play more. So this may be a similar answer than, as the last answer you gave, but what are some traits of uh, like an ideal student? Oh, ideal student. Um, first thing is just to be coachable. Okay. Um, yeah, I have kind of a joke. It's not really a joke, actually. I was thinking of writing an article at some point. I probably will about this, but I think women in, as a whole learn jiu-jitsu much faster than men do. And I've had... Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of students. I've had a lot of female students, a lot of male students. And just in general, the female students I've had that have stuck with jiu-jitsu have learned much, much quicker. And there's multiple reasons for it, but I think one of them is, you know, if I were to tell one of my uh, female competitors and say, uh, don't do this, and, and uh, you know, and they either understand why I'm saying it or they don't, and, I'll, and in which case I'll explain to them why I don't want them to do that, because I want them to understand the why part of it. I want them to understand the art. It's not, this is not like a dictatorship. It's like, yeah. I'm not telling you don't do it, so you don't do it. I'm telling you don't do it because if you don't do it, this happens to your body, and, this, and that, as such, this could happen to you. And once they understand that, and they recognize that it makes sense, they just stop doing it. Like they just won't make that mistake anymore. And with with men, a lot of times what happens is they'll say, don't do that. If you do that, this will happen, and this is a bad habit, that you, and here's why. And they may understand it. Like They'll look and go, ah, oh, that makes sense, and he's been doing it a long time, and yeah, that's logical, and all that. But then when I'm not looking, and there's another dude there, and they get into their uh, role, and they know that even though it's a bad habit, if they do it one more time, they'll win this match. They do it one more time. Yeah. And that's somebody that's never going to be very good at jiu-jitsu because they're not coachable. They care more about winning against the other meathead in the gym than they do learning jiu-jitsu. And as a whole, I think just women have less of that. And if you wanted to just uh, use one word to describe that, I would just call it being coachable. So that's the first the first thing. And the second thing I look for is intelligence. Just and if they have those two things, if they're coachable and they're intelligent, then all that's left is getting them to calm down. And as soon as I can get them to calm down, that's like a five or six year black belt. No problem. Cool. I, am, I am absolutely confident. If I walk somebody, if somebody walks into my gym, if they're coachable from day one, they don't repeat their mistakes. That's really, when I say coachable, that's what I mean. You don't continually repeat your mistakes. You make a mistake, you recognize a mistake, you cease making a mistake because that's the logical thing to do. Yeah. They're coachable, they're smart, and they're calm, and they train a couple days a week. There's no reason why somebody can't be rolling at a black belt level, you know, where they can compete with other black belts in like five or six years. Absolutely no reason. And that's focusing a lot on the fundamentals and and and, and doing that. All, and all fundamentals. I do like. I mean, it's not really didn't really need to be said with you here, but uh, nowhere are you mentioning like uh, that they could bench 400 pounds or that they're fast. Or that they no. they don't get you know like this stuff doesn't matter like so if you're in the in the if, if you're listening to this and you and you're in the gym getting ready to start jujitsu and you're just gonna get to where you're a little stronger it's not who cares go, it's time to go train trying right. to start learning they could dominate um, blue belt and they might even be able to go down and win Pan Ams and Worlds of blue belt if they're extraordinarily uh, athletic and strong explosive and and have enough jujitsu knowledge behind them. But ultimately, in the sport, uh, at least at the higher levels, like at the Pan Ams or Mundials in, in L.A., 
they will reach a glass ceiling that usually occurs around purple belt, where yeah. unless their technique catches up to their physicality, they just won't be able to go any further. And that's what makes the, the art so cool. It's not to say that the you know the the guys that are meddling, the men and women that are meddling at the higher belts aren't great athletes. They're also strong, but it's just like everybody's strong, dude. Everybody's explosive, you know. Andre Galvao's explosive. He's strong. Yeah, you can lift. You can be able to bench twenty more pounds than him. You're still gonna. <laughs> so ultimately, like the strong and the smart thing, I remember that was that Hickson um, documentary choke years ago. It was like strong guys go on trees. I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. So it, it's the jujitsu technique that uh, that makes the difference at the, at the upper levels. And so why not begin with that assumption and start working the jujitsu technique from day one? Because the strength and the speed is easy. Cool. My fans would not be happy with me if I didn't. We didn't talk a little bit more about Conor McGregor. He just got a brown belt. Oh, is that correct? Yes. Does he did? Okay. Uh, just a little more insight on on how he's how he's doing or what's what's going on with him. If you have sure. Any... I mean, uh, uh, I've seen people before um, from totally different organizations give MMA fighters brown belts or black belts because they do great in MMA. And that's not what happened here. So that needs to be, uh, everybody needs to completely understand that. Yeah. I think everybody that knows Connor or knows Kavanaugh or knows SPG knows that. But, you know, for your public that may not know, Connor is a great brown belt. I mean, he, no gi, gi, I have no doubt in my mind. And if, if all of a sudden you decided tomorrow you wanted to stop competing in MMA and you put on a gi for six months or a year and went down, I have no doubt he'd be a terror in his. Uh, division is a brown belt. There's just, there's just no doubt in my mind. So he was given the brown belt after that fight, not because he won the fight or because he's doing great at MMA, but because he's a legitimate brown belt. And that was a, a, a poignant moment between a coach and his athlete. But, you know, we ranked jujitsu as a separate thing. And so uh, I have always done that. And I know uh, John Cavanaugh does that. So when he gave Connor his brown belt, Con- Connor McGregor got his brown belt because he's a He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu brown belt. Uh, nobody's really got a chance, I guess, to fight before last, or, or actually three, two fights ago, you got to see a little bit, but nobody's really got to see a chance because nobody's got past his hand. I don't yeah. know that anybody will. Um, but if they do, or if he decides he wants to take somebody down someday, because he just might decide that that's what he wants to do, everybody will see his jiu-jitsu is at a very high level. Cool, and I'm looking forward to that. I mean, it's, it's fun to watch standing up, but I do... Obviously, enjoy the ground game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Does he? Um, is he training with the gi pretty much ever? I mean, or is that? I mean, is that uh, disruptive to MMA training? I think uh, one of the rules John has, and um, I think a lot of the SPGs is this way: is you can't be on his uh, MMA competition team if you don't train in a gi. If you're not willing to put a gi on at least sometimes and come in there, you're not going to you're not going to do it. And yeah, I've seen. Uh, I've been down there and. I, and uh, in the gym before and watch Connor rolling around both in a gi and without. So it was like I said um, at the beginning of our interview, you know, if your fundamentals are solid and just like with Connor's, like you see Connor's stand-up movement is based on, on good stand-up is based on distance and timing. Yeah. Distance, timing, timing and body mechanics, right? And the ground game is very similar. It's, it's, it's hip movement, it's timing um, and posture. And so his, his ground game is going to be solid fundamentals, just like his stand-up is solid fundamentals. And it won't matter whether he puts a gi on or takes a gi off or puts MMA gloves on or takes MMA gloves off or if it's in a parking lot or if it's in an octagon. You know, those, those fundamental reactions based on the delivery system and the physics and leverage of jiu-jitsu, those are ingrained in him. In order to get an SBG brown belt, they have to be ingrained yeah. in you. And so uh, it won't make any difference. So what does, if, if you are basically required to to put a gi on occasionally and as an MMA guy, um, what does that, what benefit does that provide to them? Well, first of all, you're just making sure that it's somebody who's willing to do it. Yeah. Like if I had okay. somebody that just adamantly refused to do it, I probably wouldn't, I, I, I don't want to, I don't uh, want to speak for John. I mean, he's yeah. His, yeah. He's a cabbie and that's, that's his thing. But from my, my perspective, I, I, it'd probably be somebody I wouldn't want on my mat just in terms of general attitude. And second of all, you know, we respect, I respect, I've always respected jiu-jitsu as an art. I mean, when I started uh, SBG, and we talked about at the very beginning, I didn't start SBG because I wanted to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, or Gracie jiu-jitsu, as it was called at that time. I didn't start SBG because um, I was interested in MMA. MMA didn't exist. The UFC was just about to start. when I, I, I got my exposure to Gracie jiu-jitsu before the UFC ever began. 
I started SBG because I want to learn how to fight. And I think um, most of my black belts, and John uh, as well, John Cavanaugh, is the same way. And I think Connor's the same way. I think he's interested in fighting, and he's interested in human movement. And MMA is a vehicle for that. Um, a simple way to put it, and it's a distinction that I really don't think a lot of MMA coaches have caught on to yet, but it's, it's something very powerful that John uh, Cavanaugh has there in SBG Ireland at his academy that a lot of other coaches and uh, MMA schools don't have is that Connor and I'll say Goonie as well, Gunnar Nelson and, and, and the other guys there that are fighting on John's team at SBG yeah. Ireland. They're fighting because they love to train. They're not, when they, when they show up to train, they show up to train because they love to train. Like when Connor, he, Connor's, the John doesn't have to pick up the phone and go, Connor, are you doing your, are you running? You know, are you showing up for practice? <laughs> He's in the gym because he loves to train. He's doing stand up because he loves stand up. He does jujitsu because he loves jujitsu. And fighting is just, you know, a part of that. Whereas, uh, there's, a lot of other MMA athletes, I, I, I don't want to attach a number to it, but I think there's a good portion of MMA athletes who train because they want to fight. Like if they were, if they didn't have a fight coming up or they weren't fighters, quote unquote, and they haven't adopted, they haven't adopted that, uh, that image for themselves. Yeah. Or if their whole, if their whole goal wasn't fighting, they wouldn't train. They wouldn't do jujitsu. They would go do something else. They go rock fight. And I have those guys come in and out of my gym all the time. And I don't want to be in the corner with those guys. This is not, I'm not, and I, 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 believe me, I'm not demeaning them in any way. Because anybody that steps in the cage, anybody that does the sport, I think it's awesome. I think people can do it for lots of different reasons. So I'm not, I'm not denigrating them at all. I'm just saying from, from the culture that I want at my gym, I don't want somebody that's here training because they want to take a fight. I want people who will take a fight just because they're training and they want to see what it's like. Yeah. And um, that's a totally different animal. It's a completely different animal. And that's what um, Connor is, and that's what Goonie is. And, and if they decide to stop fighting tomorrow or whatever, I would be shocked if they stopped training. I mean, they'll be in the gym the next day doing jiu-jitsu or doing this. So why wouldn't they put on a gate? They love jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Why wouldn't you, uh, why wouldn't you uh, keep doing stand-up? Or, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an intellectual exercise for them as much as it is a physical one it is it is everything that um, it is meant to be at its highest levels for those guys it's not uh training is it's not a means to an end you know it is an end in and of itself and mma in that sense fighting publicly in that sense is a means to an end it's a means to a paycheck you know and yeah. it means to test yourself which is amazing and, and beautiful but but their martial art is first that's a huge, huge difference. I can't, I mean, I, I know guys do it, but I can't imagine doing this and not loving it and still doing it. Like, I, when, when I introduce people to jiu-jitsu, I'll say, give it, give it some time. It may be a little unusual at first, but, you know, after a month or two, if you don't like it or love it, that's okay. I mean, it's not for everybody, but don't Absolutely. do this if, if you think it sucks. Like, that's it's terrible if, it, if you don't like it. You're getting choked, you're getting Absolutely. smashed. <laughs> That's absolutely right. You know, you can tell you can tell the difference. Like um, years ago, a uh, long time ago, I, I used to uh, train quite a bit with uh, Randy Couture, who would yeah. come to my gym and and, and we, would, we would spar. But he's an example of a guy back then. He loved to train. I mean, he loved to do wrestling. He loved to do fighting. And I think I think one day he was just watching the UFC and he thought to himself, "Hell, oh, I could do that." He went to try it on kind of a lark and, and became it. But I would be shocked. I haven't talked to Randy in a while, but I would be shocked if right now, uh, as time permits, because I'm sure he's doing all kinds of other uh, <laughs> stuff, but he doesn't get on the mat and still roll. Yeah. He doesn't get on the mat and still train. And he was always interested in anything anybody else had to show him um, and open-minded in that sense about learning. And, and that reflected itself in his performance in the cage as well. And just to, I mentioned him because, by contrast, I've also known other wrestlers who – clearly didn't really like jujitsu, didn't really like, um, maybe even really like training that much. They just wanted to fight for whatever reason, like a challenge of fighting and the publicity of fighting, the, the money of fighting, you know, the walking to the cage, the, the, all the stuff that comes with that is what they were after. And the training was kind of a means to an end. And maybe if they were at a high enough level before they'd be good for a short while, but there was always a, 
uh, obvious and inherent weakness in them because they were doing it as an end in and of itself as opposed uh, to just the love of, of the art, the love of, of fighting. And they, they're, just, they're just different. I, and again, I don't want to get well, like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, denigrating them in any way. I just yeah. think that they're two different animals. Yeah. And um, I prefer working with the animals that are that do this out of, because they love it. Because yeah. when you're there with an athlete who does it because he loves it, then it's an honor. Yeah, there's a big you're difference. there with an athlete who's just doing it because he other reasons, it's, uh, it can be a huge bummer. Yeah, well, and I think of like the wrestler who wrestled their whole life and, and ended up getting a scholarship in college, and they're doing it because they're good at it, not because they love it anymore. That's that that, that passion exactly. is gone, and, and I think a lot of the talking about being creative earlier. You know, sometimes I wake up and I'm thinking about jujitsu. Right when I get out of bed, it's like that's some like my mind was working on that for a while. But if you don't love it anymore, that creativity is gone. That fire, that passion is not is is not with you anymore. Absolutely, yeah, that's that's it. And uh, and so you know, back to what you're you're asking me initially about uh, about Connor. Yeah, uh, talking about John Cavanaugh, that is the environment that he's created in this gym. I mean, I don't think, again, you know, you can ask him, but I don't think he ever you know recruited anybody. I don't think he ever tried to look for any of these guys himself. It's not to say he doesn't have a good eye to see it because he does, but. I think it's just, you know, these are the guys that love this. They would be doing it anyway. They decided, you know, kind of like Randy did, oh, let's see if, what it's like to fight in a cage. They're obviously really good at it because um, because they love it to begin with. But, you know, it, it happened in, in, a, in a manner speaking organically. And, and, and that's because John's not, you know, even though I think he's probably running, if not the best, one of the best MMA academies in the world, and especially, you know, in Europe, but he's also running an academy that's for martial artists. Yeah. You know, he always has, and that hasn't changed. And so his fight that's team awesome. is part of that. But it's it's not just like it's not an MMA gym where only guys that want to fight come in, and uh, and guys that that are interested in, in getting in the cage and fighting come to John and train for a few months, and he puts them in the cage and see how he, they do his prospects. No, this is a place where people go in as fourteen year old kids, put on a white belt, put on a gi get in the cage, put on boxing gloves, learn from day one from with great coaches like John, get built up to a certain level, then go up to them and say, hey, I'd like to take a fight. And it turns out they're awesome because inherent in them is a love for the entire activity. And that's just a, it's just a different environment. That's cool. I like how we, I, I like where the conversation went to, to the passion for the sport and the, the martial arts. If somebody wants to get a hold of you or train with you or keep up with your, when you're doing seminars, what would be the best way for them to do that? straightblastgym.com so www.straightblastgym all one word dot com um, my email is uh, is there it's also spginfo all one word spginfo at yahoo.com that goes directly to me and they can uh, they, they can reach me there cool thank you and um, I'll put that up on the website for anybody to, to get if they didn't get that written down in time and of course thank you very much for coming on the show really appreciate it uh huh take care alright yep bye bye all right, that was Matt Thornton uh, giving us the interview. We really appreciate that. He he hit a lot of things right, like a nail in the head. You know, like his his approach towards training is is like second to none. He's he's made some big steps for everybody. I mean, you, even if you never trained with him or heard of him, odds are like some of his training principles have gotten down to the gym that you're at, and and he's really brought it up like a couple steps from what it, what it was for sure. Yeah, I mean, he's been on the forefront from. As long as I've been training jujitsu, you know, and yeah, there a long time. And he's been, he said, he'd been rolling for like twenty four years. Yeah, he's so. been. Uh, I don't think there's very too many people here in the United States who have uh, got more experience or than than Matt Thornton. Does. Yep. So if he didn't quite get enough Matt Thornton action, like we said, next week he's going to deliver our quote of the week. So that's going to be fun. Um, he goes right along hand in hand with a lot of his training principles. So um, definitely check that out next week. So Gary, good news, man. So last time we played what was a sad song, and and we didn't realize it, but some people may not have understood what that song was, like the... The Arms of an Angel yeah, song. Yeah, like, okay, so here, at least, I imagine it's all over the U.S., but... Everybody in the United States is probably sick. Yeah, so it's like, it's so sad, like, they, they show these, like, sick dogs, and, and, and they need, like, help to, to get these dogs, like, medical treatment and find them a home and stuff. It's like the saddest commercial you could ever imagine, and they play that song that we played last week, um, and they and they just kind of it just you could be having a good day, and that and comes on. That it's song. like 
I don't want to. Oh man, <laughs> it's just so sad. So we played that, and we we you know we're all sad about that. We didn't have any uh, funny reviews to to read on the podcast and it worked. here. It worked. We got three reviews in one week. Yeah, that's a new record. I think that absolutely it's a new yeah. record. Yeah. So we'll be continuing to try to d- make everybody more depressed to get yeah. the crank reviews out of you guys. <laughs> no, we won't do that. But uh, one of them was a, a funny review. The other two were just uh, uh, more real, but they were also they were good. Um, and do remember, and if you guys uh, that have written reviews in the past, I can't send an email to I can't send a patch to a review. I need an address. I need a contact information. So you yeah, do so need to email bjjbrick at gmail dot com. Um, and still do that if you've written a review already. And yeah. We'll you. Willie in New Jersey and Jay Fairbanks, uh, you guys both gave us reviews last week. Please send us an email with your address so we can get you out the patch. Um, we just need uh, need your address, uh, bjjbrick at gmail.com. Yep. And then uh, so w- Willie, he says some nice things about us. Um, he's he's training for just about a year or so, and he didn't have any jokes is what he said. But then he uh, had a little typo, which I appreciated. He says, I'd like to, to get one of the uh, – your pads on our my gi instead of patch, so we'll we send could, it out a pad. Yeah, we can do some pads. <laughs> but wouldn't that make us douches? Douches. <laughs> so uh that's good, man. We appreciate the nice things you say. We're glad Thanks, you listen, really. buddy. Yep. Um so we'll tease you back a little bit occasionally too. Um our uh buddy uh he went by the name of Night Stalker. He said uh and his little thing is all fire. I don't, I don't know how you got pictures on the uh title of the of the uh, review, but it's all fire. It says some men can't be negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. That's Gary and Byron. Dot dot dot. And you know, Byron is a firefighter. Yeah, so that's kind of weird, man. He probably you're in the right job. You get to watch stuff burn and then put it out. Yeah, I try to put it out. Yeah. Um. So that's a quote from a movie, one of the Batman movies. Oh, okay. they're talking about. Uh, I assume the one of the bad guys. I get I get it mixed okay. up. But so we're the bad guys. Or the Joker. Yeah, yeah. Gary's Sweet. the bad guy. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so thank you. Uh, very good stuff. And the other guy said, um, the guy from uh, Fairbanks said, uh, super great and exciting sometimes. Sometimes I sometimes. like that. We'll try to make it exciting more. And often. he says that we are the best BJJ podcast for the money. I I do agree. Yeah. It's hard to compare uh, something that's free to something that you'd pay for. But uh, hope free you guys is good. Are, yeah, free is good. Thanks, thanks yeah. guys, for the support. Yep. Would we you... appreciate those uh, uh, reviews. Uh, definitely uh, don't forget to send us the email so we can with your address so we can get you out of patch. We, uh, we'd appreciate it. And uh, bjjbrick at gmail.com. Yeah, we do have a Facebook page. Um, oh, people were asking about doing the reviews so we keep going back to this darn thing um uh, itunes is a good place to write, write a review we appreciate that or stitcher radio um a little confusion about where to put a review up if it was facebook oh. or not but just I, those two are the best places to go they help the show out um and yep we do appreciate that we do a facebook page website is btjbrick.com if you are in the wichita area in wichita kansas drop us an email and we'd be happy to train with you guys all right gary i think it's about a wrap yeah, definitely, uh, but listen to the music, and after the music, stay tuned for uh, Ultimate Dancing with Byron's Mom. Whoa, sounds good. We're going to talk about uh, Randy Couture again. Yep, we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. All right, guys. Well, uh, our newest segment, um, short-lived, I would say, uh, three times here, but Ultimate Dancing with my mom. Uh, mom, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Thanks. Good. Um, it's great for me, but not so great for Randy. What? I thought he was great. Yeah. He Well, he, he is great. He didn't <laughs> get enough votes this week to um, to stay on the show, so... Sad to say that on Monday night, and they didn't have a, a um, an elimination um, show on Tuesday. They did it all on Monday. Um, he was eliminated. So he danced and got and eliminated in the same show. He danced, and um, and he had to dance first again, which I thought was not fair. But that's just my opinion. 
um, and, and he wasn't dancing his best. His best dance was his first one, the Foxtrot. Yeah. But um, he did he did a good job, and the crowd likes him, and the judges liked him, and everyone was just completely shocked when when they announced <laughs> the end of the show that he was eliminated. And it's just by uh, by votes, people call in and, and didn't vote for right, him. Right, huh? right. Uh huh. It's just it's you know it's, I guess it's a um, it's a combination of a popularity contest among um, the millions out there that watch <laughs> the show and and who really don't know him and his um, dedication and his drive and yeah. all that all the good stuff that he has. But um, there and there are still some dancers left on the show that then weren't as talented as a dancer as he had become. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of not fair, but it That's is how what it, goes. it is. Yeah. That's all right. I, you know, I had a little bit of a theory that maybe you were sugarcoating, uh, if he was actually kind of bad or not. And, no, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I don't think I was sugarcoating. I was, I was, you could say I was being polite, but definitely not sugarcoating because he was, he was dancing. Yeah. He was, um, and his first dance was really good. Okay, yeah. just making sure you weren't you weren't putting no. the, the mom spin on it and being extra nice when <laughs> when he was doing bad. Right, the mom spin. <laughs> oh well, yeah, moms tend to do that. But um, but yeah, he he had such a good personality and um, and he had a good partner. And so I'm sure we'll see him again at the very last, um, the very finals when they when they get to that point. So. It'll be interesting to see him then too, but but he's off the show for now. Okay, well, thanks. It's been fun having you on here, and, and the the audience has sure loved it. They kind of get a kick out of getting the updates from you. Okay, well, I'll look forward to next season. See if there's anybody of, uh, <laughs> of uh, that you might know. Okay, um, going to be a dancer again. I'll let you know. All right. Well, thanks, mom. Oh, you're welcome. Bye. Here is another segment of unnecessary censorship. <laughs> but can you imagine those judges? They're probably on their, I don't know how many seasons they've had, but they've been on there a lot. Yeah. You imagine it must have been a little terrifying to uh, Randy Couture off. <laughs> yeah. I think, no, I think the audience. No. I'm not sure. No? Or, yeah, maybe the audience does, but I think, because I have being, watched it before. Yeah. Like they give they them scores. Yeah, you're right. I do think the audience gets involved. 